thank you for being here. We're going to start our first C of history this evening. We'll have six more to go, but we're going to deal with creation this morning. And I am going to be in Genesis chapter 1. The book of Genesis um, is an interesting book for lots of reasons that uh, some of you are well aware of. Uh, it tells us about um, uh, God and him creating the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. I want to do three things in this study, however. And the first thing I want to make sure we do, though, is let's not read through the first chapter of Genesis like it's a child's story. What I'd like to do is to take on fresh eyes and look at, and look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 from a fresh perspective, a new perspective, a uh, invigorated fr perspective, not an old, tired, I've heard this before, there's nothing I can learn by reading it again perspective, all right? So let's get on, put on new eyes as we, we think about uh, this study. So what I want to do is I want to talk about what happened on each creation day, okay? And the second thing I want to do is to compare the events of creation week with an evolutionary perspective of origins, and then lastly, what I, do, what I want to do, as I had promised you from our introductory uh, time together, is to consider the profound, profound implications of God as our creator owner, okay? I hope uh, to be able to, uh, to make these things clear to you. Before we do all that, what I want to do is I'd like to establish the basis upon which we derive our interpretation of the word day in Genesis chapter 1. This is really an important issue. Now, we're going to do Bible studies in here, so we're actually going to consult our Bibles a lot over the next seven sessions, counting this one. So, you come tomorrow, please bring your Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, would you go there, please? And let's see what the author uh, of all things, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the man of, of, of God, has to say about uh, Genesis and, and the origin of all things here, okay? <clears throat> I'd already mentioned to you that, that the first thing the Lord wants us to know about him when we open his word is that in the beginning God created. And there are implications to that truth as I will get to in the latter part of our session here this evening. But in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth is what Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says. Verse 2, And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. As I mentioned to you, what I want to do is establish the basis upon which we derive our interpretation of the word day in Genesis chapter uh, 1. We know that <clears throat> as we read these verses on the screen, all the way through the first chapter of, of Genesis, even into uh, Genesis chapter 2, we will read the word day mentioned seven times, one for each day. The, first, the six days of creation and the rest day, which is day seven. But what does that word day mean? That's important because this has been controversial among Bible scholars for at least 150 years. What in the world that day means? Could it be an indefinite period of time? Some theologians think so. The reason they wanted to start thinking that way is because they needed to find time in the scriptures for evolution to take place. Did you know that? So, if we, if we, so we've got to find a bunch of time for all of this evolution to unfold over millions of years. Maybe the original writer here, when he wrote, wrote the word day, means that though each of those creation days could be an indefinite period of time. If they can, maybe we have the time here in the book of Genesis for evolution to take place. But you know where I'm coming from this perspective. What does that word day mean? I believe it means a literal 24-hour day. Okay, so the Lord literally created all we know exists in seven 24-hour days. Actually, six, since the seventh day he rested. Six 24-hour days. Let me show you where I get that. That word day there in, in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 5, as well as the other days mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 1, I believe refer to a literal 24-hour period of time. Now, to answer these questions, we need to remember that God has the ability to communicate his thoughts clearly, right, uh, and, and concisely. After all, he is the creator of language. He knew that the original readers of Genesis, which would be the children of Israel, were not Hebrew scholars and were not scientists. He knew that they were former slaves, mostly uneducated, on their way 
to or newly arrived in the promised land. Uh, it was he who in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1 all the way through verse 7, commanded the fathers to teach their children. So in order for fathers to do that effectively, God led Moses in writing the book of Genesis to use a very clear, concise, straightforward language. Get this now. It is inconceivable that the, that the God of the universe, the creator of language itself, is incapable of communicating exactly what he means. Right? I believe in a literal interpretation of the scriptures. Unless we're told that it's allegorical or poetic, we are to take it exactly the way the Lord gave it to us. Think about how important that is. To, to take God's word at face value. To not take it at face value implies the creator of the universe can't communicate what he means. Which of course is silly. When we look carefully at Genesis chapter 1 in Hebrew or in English, it is clear that God created everything in six literal 24-hour days. The word day, the Hebrew word is yom, is clearly defined the first time it's used um, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 where it says God called the light day or God called the light yom and the evening and the morning were the first yom. That word yom is used throughout the first chapter of the book of Genesis for the word day. Okay, Yom always means a definite period of time when the adjectives first day, second day, etc. and the terminal references evening and morning occurs with it. Okay, Every time, every time, this word yom means a, a literal 24-hour period of time when the adjectives first day and second day and the terminal references evening and morning are associated with it. Every time, okay? Every time. I fully acknowledge that, that yom can have a number of meanings, um, only one of which is a day of 24 hours. But in Genesis chapter 1, the definition is provided. You get it? The adjectives, first day, second day, third day, etc., and the terminal references, evening and morning, inform the reader how to properly uh, interpret the meaning of the word. All right? By the way, everywhere, everywhere else in the Old Testament, when the word yom appears with evening or morning, or is modified by a number, the sixth day or five days, it always means a 24-hour day. Okay? If God's intention had been to inform us that each day of creation were actually long periods of time, guys, there is a clearer, more straightforward way to do so. For example, the Hebrew word olam, meaning a long indefinite period, should have been used instead of yom. It's as if God's intention to describe his acts of creation in six literal solar days you know, it would have been impossible to express this concept any more clearly than the way that he did. Okay? That's important to remember. God can say exactly what he means, and we don't have to explain it away. Um, as I had mentioned uh, to you, uh, the length of days in, of creation in Genesis 1 has been involved in a major controversy uh, in biblical interpretation for over 150 years. Many theologians, many theologians have sought to redefine the term to accommodate the time necessary for evolution to occur. This perspective of the word day in Genesis chapter 1 has come to be known as the day-age theory. Day-agers, as I call them, people who adhere to this way of, of viewing the scriptures, further seek to strengthen their position uh, with the use of Psalm chapter 90 verse 4 and 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. Um, which compare a day to a thousand years. You've heard of that argument before. But both of these verses, however, are simply using figures of speech. We call those similes. To show that God is not constrained by time as mankind is. Okay? These verses are actually irrelevant to the discussion of the meaning of day um, in Genesis chapter 1. Now, now, let's take a look at what God did on, on each day of creation week, okay? You're going to find this interesting. Again, let's take a, let's take a fresh approach to, to these verses. You've, you've, perhaps if you were raised in church, you were taught uh, uh, creation week when you were very young, and you've been taught it maybe every year since then, and it tends to get a little stale as you go through it. Let's have you know, refreshed eyes as we, we look at, at what's going on uh, each day. According to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, that we have already read, what did God create on the first day? 
right? He created light. No, I don't know how you create light, okay? I'm not going to be able to explain. We're not given the information from the Lord himself how he did these things. We're just told that he did, all right? It's a very difficult thing to get your mind around all that's going on here. But the Lord created light. He created the earth. He created a day-night cycle. These, do these verses say anything about the sun? No. God created only light on this day, not the sun. And that's an important thing to remember. He created the sun three days later on day four. Today, the sun gives us light during the day, and the moon gives us light during the night, right? So in the beginning, how could there be a day and a night without the sun? Well, actually all it takes to have a day and a night is a rotating earth and a light source coming from one direction, right? The Bible tells us clearly that God created light and the earth on the first day. And given that information, we can deduce that, we can deduce that the earth was, was rotating in space on the first day and that light was shining on it. So in the beginning, there was day and night, even though there wasn't a sun yet. Okay? You see what I mean? There are some people who believe the sun is the source of all life on earth. However, does the Bible teach this? No, it doesn't. God seems to be making a very important point here that I want you guys to see. He's, the point he is making is, is that he is the creator of everything, including the sun. He doesn't need the sun in order to create life. Okay? Okay? How about day two? We're going to pick up the story now in verse 6 and go through verse 8. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. You can see the adjectives and the evening and morning there to imply the Lord wants you and I to read these days as being 24-hour days. Well, according to the verses we just read, the first thing God did on day two was to create a space that separated the waters which were located above the earth from the waters which were located uh, on the earth. And this space was the atmosphere that would be needed to support life that, that he would soon create. Okay? You, of course, know what atmosphere is. It's, the, it's obviously the stuff that we breathe, right? God knew he, we would need to breathe, so he created oxygen on, for us on the second day. That means, of course, that oxygen did not slowly accumulate in Earth's atmosphere over millions of years. It appeared instantaneously by the words of God's mouth. Okay? Amazing. Amazing truth. Here's, here's, here's day three, starting in verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. The herb yielding seed. And the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass. Uh, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. What happened on the third day? Well, according to these verses we just read, dry land appeared with all of the soil that plants will need to grow. Okay? God then created the various kinds of plants. This sequence is important here, guys. God had a plan. He knew that the animals and the humans he would create later in the week would need to eat, so he created plants. God was fully aware of the physical and chemical requirements for each of his creatures, so he provided them prior to their arrival. On day two, God placed oxygen in the atmosphere so, so, so we could breathe. And on day three, he created plants so humans and ma animals uh, would have something to eat. A note and, and note something interesting here. Plants were created before the sun was created. And I, I view that as sort of logical evidence that the, that the days mentioned in this chapter were literal 24-hour days and not long periods of time. Because how could plants exist for thousands of years prior to the sun? Okay? That's the idea. Here's day four. Verses 14 through 19, and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. 
And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. What did, why did God create the sun, the moon, and the stars on the fourth day? Well, according to the verses we just read, he did it for us. The sun gives us heat and light energy during the day, and the moon gives us light during the night. The stars show us signs and seasons, although the seasons we have today are probably more extreme than they were in the beginning. In fact, God not only created the stars, but he also gave each one of them a name, interestingly enough. In Job chapter 38, the, the, the Lord talks about his power over the stars. And in Psalm chapter 19, we are told that the heavens declare um, his glory. God also created the rest of the planets and other stellar bodies on that day. Guys, we have, we have looked closely for the last uh, 50 years and we have sent uh, unbelievably sophisticated satellites into space with very advanced photographic abilities. And we have uh, pushed the, the, the envelope of the known universe further and further back, it seems. Every year we find what we didn't know before. And there are billions and billions of stars out there. Billions and billions of stars out there. And the Lord has a name for every one of them. What kind of a mind are we talking about here? When you can point to a star and the Lord would know its name. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean when, we, when we look at what's going on in Genesis chapter 1, we're looking at some profound things going on. Well, the Lord has a mind that is incomprehensible to you and to me. Let alone we have this remarkable mind ourselves. But think about the mind that he must have in order to be able to keep track of all those stars, it's an amazing, an amazing um, evidence of who he is. It's a, it's a picture into the kind of mind we're dealing with when we deal with God. He is unapproachable. He is incomprehensible. We cannot understand him because we don't think like he thinks. You know what I mean? That's what I get out of reading these kinds of things and why it excites me so much to be able to read these kinds of things. Let's move on to day five, starting in verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and the seas, uh, and, fill, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. What kind of creatures did God create on day five? The verses we just said or read indicate that he created sea creatures, including dinosaurs, like this plesiosaur, and flying creatures, including these pteranodons. Okay? Some people believe that over millions of years, land animals evolved into birds and into mammals. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. According to the Bible, land animals were created after flying and sea creatures. Therefore, what are we to think when we are told that, that uh, birds and whales evolved from land animals? We can know with certainty that such stories aren't true because the only eyewitness to what happened during day five has told us that birds and whales were created a day before the land animals were created. Okay? You get what I'm talking about? We're using God's word as our standard of knowledge, not mankind's knowledge about things he has no direct access to. Science can only take place in the present. Okay? What about day six? I love this part too. Day six. Start the, the, the story there in verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Wow, 
Are you kidding me here? Are you kidding me here? The Lord here is creating land animals, which would have included the dinosaurs, by the way. God also created, of course, uh, the first human on day six. This, of course, means that humans and dinosaurs lived together in the very beginning. Let's go back and pick up the story there in, in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the, tr of, of, of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat." Uh, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, therein there is life. I have given every herb for meat, and it was so, etc., etc. The point is, it's day six when we see uh, land animals and man now appear on earth. I want to make sure you see something, because I know that this is going to be countercultural. The Bible teaches the literal existence of the first human beings being Adam and Eve. They were as physical as you and I are physical. Oh, I'm sure that there were considerable differences. In those days, they wouldn't have had all the genetic mutations that you and I have in our genome. Over time, we know that sin brings about those genetic mutations, and now we are filled with genetic mutations. Adam and Eve must have been spectacular. One thing I like to do, um, uh, I, I know some, some, I've got some friends in Africa and, and these guys are, 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 are physical specimens that are just, that are just uh, you know, it's hard to fully appreciate how well that these guys are built. These are the guys that can run 26 miles at uh, 4 minutes and 30 seconds a mile, you know. These, these Kenyan uh, marathon uh, uh, athletes, they're just physically something spectacular. And whenever I watch them on television, I am reminded of what Adam must have been like. You know what I mean? He must have been spectacular. I don't know how tall he was, and I don't know how broad his shoulders were, but he would have been as close to perfect as you can be as a human being. And he must have just been spectacular. We're going to read a little bit later on when Eve was formed. She must have just been a knockout. You know what I mean? To be just this unbelievably beautiful creature. In fact, we'll, 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 we'll read how Adam responded to seeing her for the first time. You know my interpretation of the Hebrew? You know what Adam said? Wow. <laughs> Seriously. That's what Adam said in the literal. It would be, wow. Would you look at that? She's mine? Are you kidding me? You know? Um, that's the kind of thing that's happening here on day six. This isn't sterile. This isn't, this isn't um, you know, the, the development of, of, of protoplasm. This is a human being coming into existence and how the Lord has prepared his world for them to occupy. Actually, he prepared it for them to occupy forever. Now, they're going to blow it. We'll learn about that tomorrow morning. They're going to blow it, and they're going to have to leave the Garden of Eden. But the Lord has a plan. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but the Lord has a plan that's just going to knock your socks off. It really is. It's going to be amazing. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 7, provides us with more details about, about the first human. I do want to mention, though, remember now, on day 6, dinosaurs would have been created because they're land animals, right? Land animals. And I believe that, that Adam and Eve um, had access to these spectacular beasts. Take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. I want to show you something here. Some people believe that, that humans and apes shared a common ancestor a couple of million years ago. But the Bible says something quite different here in Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. Uh, starting in verse 7 there, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord uh, God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God uh, to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, we have, a, we have a, how, how the Lord actually made Adam was he made him from the elements of the ground. But also he breathed life into him. You know, there's some, there's some real problems with the, the research that's going on regarding the origin of life. 
If you're, you're familiar with that concept, that, that uh, over vast eons of time in those ancient pools, there were, there were molecules like carbon and hydrogen and nit nitrogen floating around, and then somehow that water got hit by, by a bolt of lightning, which caused those molecules to organize themselves into more complex molecules. And given enough time, those complex molecules um, combined to form more complex molecules. And then those very incredibly in uh, uh, complex molecules somehow became living a living cell you know that has been a very difficult thing for evolutionists to explain how in the world did life get started from non-life there is no answer for that I can however point you to Genesis chapter 2 and show you where that got started God breathed life into Adam I don't know exactly what that means did he perform this mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation kind of thing or did he just say you know and in the process, this, 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 this incredibly complex accumulation of molecules that was Adam's body all of a sudden became living. But whatever or however this happened, God breathed it into Adam. Some people believe that the first humans that they would call hominids were stupid knuckle-dragging brutes that had few skills and they had no language. But if you read on there starting in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2, and going all the way to verse 20, it says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. I'm just going to give you a little bit of intro into the next session. Where is Eve when the Lord gave him the instructions not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She had not been created yet. Okay? For eons, we've been blaming Eve for blowing it. Blowing it. Seriously, haven't we? Haven't you heard that taught or heard that preached? You've heard that it was Eve, Eve's fault. Adam, when he was still alone, it was going to be later in the day, we're still in the sixth day, so Eve's coming, but she, apparently she's not here yet. He got the instructions not to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of tree and evil, of the, of the, of the tree of, of good and evil from God himself. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, for I make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. For Adam there was not found and help meet for him. The point is, Adam got the job of naming all these animals. There was a language in existence. And Adam had this mental capability of seeing the differences between the kinds. And so he, he gave them names. This isn't a knuckle-dragging brute that only grunts. The Lord gave Adam full capabilities, full cerebral capabilities. And I bet he was, again, a remarkable uh, person to, uh, to see. After Adam finished naming the animal kinds, he probably realized that there was no creature like him on earth. I mean, after all, he's seen the pairs. He's seen the elephant kinds and the male and female. He's seen the cat kinds and the male and females. He's seen the dog kinds and the male and females. And of course, he's seen the bear kinds with the male and females. And he looked around and thought, I'm not paired up. Okay? I'm not paired up. Well, we're going to find out that he is going to uh, receive a pair. In, in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we're told that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. But in verses 21 through 25 of Genesis 2, we see how God created Eve. Let's take a look at that and remind you of what's going on here. Verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, you remember how I said Adam responded when he seen Eve for the first time? It's in verse 23. You can see what God said. And Adam said here, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called uh, a woman because uh, he was taken out of man. So here we got Adam now naming all of the animals. Okay? And then he, he sees, well, there's no one like me. Well, uh, you know, what in the world's going on here, Lord? I, I, uh, I'm not paired up. Well, the Lord brings uh, Eve to him 
creates her and brings uh, Eve to him. And what he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Again, my interpretation of that Hebrew is that, wow, would you look at that? That's it. By the way, I think that's the way the, a man is supposed to look at his wife. Wow, you kidding me? You made her for me? So we've got an example of this relationship that this man is going to have with this woman. And this man is head over heels, impressed with what the Lord has done for him. Okay. Now we know in day 7, according to Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, at the end of the sixth day, God created, uh, finished creating and he rested from his week. Okay. So that's, that's creation week and the various major things that took place during that time. I have to tell you one more time, just in case you're not getting it. I believe this is literal. I believe the sequence of events that took place here did take place in that way. Now, some said, well, you know, Don, um, um, you know, I kind of see what you mean by the word day, and it might very well be a 24-hour day period of time, but doesn't the sequence of creation week sort of mirror evolution over time? You ever heard that? Somebody used that? That I think the Lord in his creation is showing us how he used evolution to bring about um, all things. Well, very quickly, I want to compare this creation week with an evolutionary perspective to show you how different they are. I am going to have to use graph, but we can do it quickly, okay? We can do it quickly and fairly painlessly. Hope you can read these. On the left-hand column will be what evolution says, and on the right-hand column will be what Genesis says, okay? You'll notice that from an evolutionary perspective, flowering plants and pollinating insects evolve together through mutual benefit. But according to Genesis, plants were created on day three, insects on day six. If these days were long ages, how did flowering plants survive? We can continue on there and look at uh, stars uh, existing before the earth. That's the evolutionary perspective. But from Genesis and what we've just read, earth existed before the stars. So the order of events in, in Genesis chapter 1 regarding the creation week is nowhere near the order of events that evolution suggests. Here's a third idea. Mankind has been carnivorous, um, or at least omnivorous, from the beginning. Okay? Whereas man, where the Bible says mankind originally was vegetarian. Meat eating was not sanctioned by God until after the flood. Fourthly, birds evolve from reptiles is a, is a popular perspective of the origin of reptiles from an evolutionary perspective. But the Bible says reptiles, which would be the creeping things, were created after birds. You see? You see the difference? Uh, evolution says fishes came into existence long before the first birds did, but Genesis says both fish and birds were created the same day. I could go on and on here. Uh, evolution says insects evolved long before the first birds, but Genesis says insects, which were creeping things, were created after birds. Huge differences. Evolution says most of the Earth's animals became extinct long before mankind ever existed. Genesis says animals were created just prior to Adam's appearance. Major differences. We can go through these other, these other four, too, if you want to. Uh, first living organisms were sea organisms. Evolution makes a big deal out of, right? But Genesis says the first living things created were land plants. Uh, three more. Earth's um, uh, uh, plant life produced our oxygen-rich uh, atmosphere. In other words, it was the, or, it was the, it was the um, uh, evolution of plants. And uh, that's where our, our current atmospheric oxygen came from. Genesis says the Earth's uh, life-supporting atmosphere was created before the plants. Evolution says the first fish evolved long before the first fruit trees. Well, Genesis says fruit trees were created before the fish. And then lastly, Genesis says matter was, has always existed where Genesis says matter did not exist until God created it. So if we're going to adhere to the idea that, God's, that, that, that somehow there's vast amounts of time in Genesis chapter 1 for evolution to take place, we don't have any scriptural reason to say so. The word day refers to a literal 24-hour period of time. We don't have any scientific reason to say so um, because evolution and, and creation are so different. Don't try to force evolution into Genesis chapter 1 because it won't fit, okay? It simply won't fit. Now, with all that said, I know I have to go quickly. 
For, with all that said, what are the implications of this truth? That's what I want to emphasize here. Genesis tells, tells us about the beginning of everything. The universe, the earth, uh, plants, animals, humans, even marriage. We've just seen the first marriage take place between the first man and the first woman. We call them Adam and Eve. It, it is clear from Scripture that God, the creator of the universe, the one who has the right and the authority to establish rules of conduct, intended marriage to be between one man and one woman. Now, I know that that's highly controversial in our culture. I know that, 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 that I've got friends who would just, who would just um, sit in the chair and just get emotional about themselves for me saying that kind of thing. It really doesn't matter whether we agree or disagree with God's requirements for marriage, does it really? After all, he is the creator owner, guys. He has the prerogative and the right, um, and the authority to establish marriage, to be anything he wants it to be, and he decided that it would consist of one man and one woman. Okay? I say that for the benefit of perhaps those who haven't come to the conclusion of what they think about what marriage is. I know we've got a myriad of different opinions on what that is. And you, you Christian types, you're way too narrow. Um, if the Lord really, if, if, if you know, we understand marriage now more than we did in the past when this book was written, and we know that it really is just love between hum two human beings. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And the Lord puts um, a lot of beginnings in his word. One of the beginnings he puts in his word is marriage, where he clearly establishes it as one man and one woman. I don't hate anybody. But the point is, it's not my opinion. Here we have two people, probably a, a son on the left, arguing with his father on the right about marriage. The son is saying, listen, Dad, give me one good reason why I can't marry Bob. You know how Christians have typically responded to those kinds of questions? The way the dad does here. Because, because, because it's not right, because it's against my grain, because it's not normal. It's just, it's just wrong. How do you know it's wrong, Dad? Why don't we take our children back to the Scriptures? and show them that God established it this way. Amen. I don't hate anybody at all, ever. The point is, the Lord has instructions in his word. What I'm suggesting to you is that the implications as God is creator, owner, gives him the prerogative to establish what's right and wrong. I, I, I was in Belize a couple of years ago, a couple of years last month, in fact, with several of you in the crowd, we went down to visit a missionary of ours. And I remember going to um, the back country of Belize. And it's quite, a, quite a, a, a trip, by the way, to be in a van and to go into this uh, King Kong kind of environment, okay? This tropical type of environment. And we were headed back just to see one of these uh, works, these missionary works that were taking place a long way from anywhere, okay? And you go into these areas and there's no electricity, there's no running water. People are living in grass huts, literally grass homes. Now to you and to me, that seems very primitive. It seems like, how could that be comfortable? I don't understand how that would be nice. Actually, these, these grass huts are very well constructed. At least they are in Belize. Okay, very well constructed. And you can look at, the, look at the ceilings and the roofs, and they're comprised of, of plant tissues, plant fibers, um, woven together really tightly. So when it rains, those, those huts don't leak. I mean, they are expertly put together. And we, we visited uh, a, a village that occurred in the middle of nowhere. We went back there and started to get to know these people a little bit. We just wanted to meet them. And they're, they're, they're very gracious people, uh, people in Belize are. Very gracious. I, I, I was interested in the structures. How do you live? And, and, and you know, without electricity, without running water, um, what runs your day? You know, all those kinds of things. And I walk up to this hut, and I'm real impressed by how well it's constructed. And there was a, someone from Belize, a, a native Belizean, about right beside me. And I'm talking about, uh, did you make this? And the, and the gentleman said, yes, I, I made this. And I said, man, that is a really nice job. Uh, I, I, it would be really interesting to me to know how you actually put this stuff together. And he went through some of the details and how you gather up the plant fibers and how you weave them together to construct this, this grass hut. And I'd wondered, I said, you know, sir, um, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is your home. He said, yes, it's your home. How, uh, you made it then, right? 
He said, yes, sir, I, I made it. I said, um, what, if, what, if I, what if I, in my um, uh, curiosity of, of how this, this, this structure is built, dig a hole into the side of your home just so I could see how you put all this thing together. I'd like to kind of get in there and see how thick it is and, and all that kind of thing. He said, you know, I'm, I wouldn't appreciate that. I wouldn't appreciate that at all. I said, why? Because, you know, um, because I built this thing and because I built it, I can determine what happens to it. it, I, it I built it. So you mean that I just can't do anything I want to with it because it's yours. That's exactly right. You see where I'm going? That creator owner prerogative is really an important concept because God being the creator by his very nature has the prerogative to determine proper rules of conduct. You see what I'm talking about? Because of his status as the creator owner. It's his. He can do whatever he wants to with it. Amen. And he would be absolutely right, all ethical and all moral, in, in order to uh, be able to do that. He can do whatever he wants to with it. So when we are approached with issues such as marriage in our culture, it really doesn't matter what people say about it, whether it's a politician or somebody else in, in authority. What does God's word say about marriage? After all, he's the creator owner, and he has the right and the prerogative to say and to, to make marriage what he wants marriage to be. You get it? Hopefully that's clear to you. That's one of the implications. Therefore, given all of that thing, all of that all of what has been said, why is the doctrine of creation so important to you? Because it's vital. It, this, this doctrine is foundational to who and what we are as believers. It's, it's, it's important because your belief about your origin will determine something. Your belief about your origin will determine your worldview. Now, you've heard of worldviews before. That philosophy you have about who you are and what you are and what your rights are. You know, your worldview. If God is your creator and you know it, then your worldview is based upon his word. Amen. Whatever he says is true must be true. After all, he was there when it happened, and he is omniscient. You get it? Let, let's, actually, let's actually turn that around. That's, some, that's something really important, and I'm almost done here. For clarification, I'd like, to, I'd like to turn that around here. Obviously, your worldview will determine who you are, and that's why it's important. But for clarification, let's turn the argument around. What are the implications if the events of creation week outlined in Genesis chapter 1 are nothing more than legends and myths, as many people believe. What are the implications of telling a nation, generation after generation, that they are nothing more than the products of nature, uh, products of random mutations slowly accumulating over vast amounts of time? Then who owns them, is my point. Who sets the rules of conduct they live by? Who decides for them what is right and wrong? Well, the answer is, is simple. They do, right? As our nation continues to reject the foundational truth that God is our creator owner, the more our children are taught to reject the foundational truth that God is our creator owner in our increasingly godless public school systems, the more our children are bored with oversimplified, boring Bible studies and sermons taught by bored and ill-prepared teachers and preachers, the easier, easier it will be for them to conclude that they have the right to do whatever they want with their own lives. Why not cheat on exams? Why not steal? Why not abort babies? Why not be homosexual? Who says I can't own a slave? That's happening in this world. Who can tell me those things are wrong when right and wrong don't exist and truth is, truth is relevant, right? And why should we listen to those Christians anyway? They're only intolerant hate mongers, we're called, right? Well, Henry Morris, I believe, beautifully summed this whole issue up back in 1987 when he wrote these words. Henry Morris said, One's belief concerning his origin will inevitably determine his belief concerning his purpose and his destiny. You get that? Do you get what he's saying? That's beautiful. Your concept 
of your origin, your belief on where you came from, will inevitably determine the purpose you have in life and your destiny. He, he goes on to say, a naturalistic, animalistic concept of beginnings. That's an evolutionary perspective. Specifies a naturalistic, animalistic program for the future. You get the idea? That if you believe that you are a result of innumerable uh, genetic mutations accumulating over vast eons of time, then you have to create your own reality. What purpose is there if you are an accident of nature? Think about it. What destiny do you have in life if you are an accident of nature? You have no purpose at all in life if you evolved. It's true, isn't it? Isn't that a natural extension of that worldview? Lastly, Henry says this. He says, an origin at the hands of an omnipotent, holy, loving God, on the other hand, necessarily predicts a divine purpose in history and an assurance of the consummation of that purpose. You are not an accident. You are created in the image of God. The Lord loves you. He has a purpose for you. And the decisions you make on, in, in this life will determine your future. You will not just, exceed, you will not just um, um, cease to exist when you live this life, when you leave this life. We are eternal spiritual beings. We are going to live forever. It is the concern of this body of believers here at Shady Grove to let you know it's really important where you're going to spend that eternity. What we're going to learn when we come back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning is we're going to get into the issue of corruption where sin and evil entered the world. And we're going to learn that even though um, sin entered the world, Adam and Eve sinned, they, they, they consumed the fruit of the knowledge of, of, of the, the, they consumed the, the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Even though they sinned, the Lord has a plan Starting as early as the book of Genesis in chapter 3, God tells them he is going to bring someone who can save them from their sins. Very early in Scripture. You don't think the, the, the Old Testament has anything to do with Christ? That means you haven't read the Old Testament very closely. Because there are a myriad of different references to that coming Messiah. You have a purpose in life. You are not an accident. And because you have a purpose, let's find out what the Lord wants you to do with your life and then spend it the way he wants you to spend it. I have to tell you, it's an emotional thing for me. Because I have colleagues who feel that their intelligence, which can be considerable in some cases, is all that they need. They feel that they have everything that they need. There's, there's nothing that they have need of. They are intelligent, and when they pass on, they will just cease to exist. They've spent their entire careers studying evolutionary ideas, trying to figure out how evolution actually took place. And you know the sad part of that? It didn't occur. How can you tell someone who spent 40 years studying evolution that you have wasted your life trying to come to a conclusion that doesn't exist? Talk about without purpose. The Lord gives us purpose. Because He is our Creator Redeemer, we have purpose. And you are important. So much so, the Lord God Almighty sent His Son to die for you so your fellowship with the Almighty could be reestablished. Wow! Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. That's the truth. As per God's Word. The implications of the events of Creation Week occurring the way the Bible clearly says they occur, are profound indeed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the love that you have for us. 
Thank you, Father, for allowing us this time together to study your word there in Genesis chapter 1 and parts of chapter 2 where you lay out all those things that you did in the beginning. Lord, it's exciting to know that you are actively involved in creation. It's exciting to know you are still actively involved in creation. And thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity this evening to, to fully or be, at least better understand the implications of the truth in the early chapters of Genesis. Lord, we are not accidents. Lord, you created us with a purpose. We are created in the image of God. Lord, I pray that as these truths are dispensed in this room and other places, Father, I pray that you would help us all to seriously consider the implications of you as the creator owner. Lord, it's your prerogative to establish the rules as you see them. Lord, help us to know what they are. Help us to be in harmony with them so our fellowship with you will be sweet. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you, Father, for sending your only son Thank you, Father, for the truth of the gospel. And Lord, if there's an unsaved person within the sound of my voice, I pray, Lord, they would seriously consider their relationship with you. Only you make sense. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen.